The Teton Mountains are sharp, jagged, and sky high, reaching elevations of 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet in some areas. But what's so special about this little segment of the Rocky Mountains? Well, here's a twist. Despite being located within the Rockies, the Tetons are technically not part of the Rockies. They were formed much later and faster than the majority of Rocky Mountains, which is one of the main reasons they're still so pointy. So when did the Tetons form? What caused their formation? How did they rise so suddenly? And are they still growing today? In this video, we're exploring Grand Teton National Park to uncover the geological story behind these amazing mountains. From over 2.5 billion year old basement rocks to modern earthquakes. The rocks that make up most of the Teton Range are some of the oldest in North America. 2.7 billion year old gneiss, which is metamorphosed or heavily altered granite. Fun fact, this gneiss is older than all multicellular life on Earth, and it formed deep in Earth's crust during early continental collisions that helped build the North American Craton, the stable interior of the North American continent. As we talked about in my recent video about Yellowstone's geologic history, the stable interior of the continent, the Craton, is actually what North America used to look like. Then, over hundreds of millions of years of plate tectonics, the Craton accumulated more land along its western margin, due to what we call accretion. As other continental landmasses and island arcs slammed into this margin, much of this crustal material accreted onto the continent, essentially expanding the size of North America over time. We can see these super old metamorphic rocks exposed along the base of the Tetons. They look twisted, banded, deformed, and intruded by younger granites. Actually, for example, so you can see here we've got this really old 2.7 billion year old nice here the original rock that was here and then this the shoot of granitic magma that came in and intruded this rock this is that younger granite that has come in and made all sorts of intrusions into the older older nice however both are still over 2 billion years old which is just crazy and they make up pan this way they make up all of this pretty much there's some sedimentary rocks in here which we'll get to but they make up most of this range, which is insane. These younger granites formed later, around 2.5 to 2.4 billion years ago, when granitic magma intruded into the existing gneiss. And the term intrusion just refers to magma forcing its way up into pre-existing rocks near the surface. Granite doesn't erupt at the surface like lava. Instead, it forms when magma slowly solidifies underground. This is actually why granite has much larger grains than its lava-formed equivalent, rhyolite. Rhyolite is the same composition as granite, but it has much smaller grains because it cooled from lava at Earth's surface. And when lava cools at Earth's surface, it solidifies so much faster than magma cooling underground because it's cooling at a much lower temperature. So this faster rate of cooling doesn't allow time for large crystals to form. This is actually one of the concepts that interests me greatly. So if you'd like me to make a whole video about this concept, I can. <laughs> anyway, this ancient crust was later covered by a series of shallow seas that formed intermittently across North America as sea level fluctuated throughout the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. In other words, from around 540 to 70 million years ago. Again, recall that this region used to be much closer to the continental margin and thus the ocean. And within these shallow seas that had transgressed onto or come onto the continent, layers of limestone, sandstone, and shale were deposited. Marine fossils and even some dinosaur tracks have been found in these sedimentary layers. And fun fact, there is over 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet of sedimentary rock stacked on top of the 2.5 billion year old basement rock here, but it's since been eroded away from the Tetons. Actually, that's one of the things that makes these mountains so cool. You see, unlike most places where younger sediments cover up these super old rocks, the Tetons have been uplifted and eroded to the point that these old rocks now poke above the younger ones. So how exactly did this happen? We've talked about how and when the rocks in this region formed, but how did these mountains form? 
Well, from around 80 to 40 million years ago, the Laramide orogeny, or mountain building event, formed much of the Rocky Mountains due to compressional tectonic forces that thickened the crust. But even after all that, this region remained relatively flat. It wasn't until much later that these mountains rose, around 9 to 10 million years ago, when the tectonic stress switched from compression to extension. And you may be thinking, wouldn't tectonic extension cause basins to form instead of mountains? And well, you're right. As the crust stretched and thinned, cracks formed, and along some of these cracks, blocks of crust would drop down, forming what we call normal faults, which would result in a basin and an adjacent mountain range. This is actually why we call much of Western North America the Basin and Range Province. And one such example of a basin and range that formed this way is the Tetons. The Teton Fault is a massive normal fault that formed as the crust was pulled apart, causing the eastern block, Jackson Hole, to drop down, and the western block, the Teton Range, to tilt and rise. And fun fact, the Tetons were so rapidly uplifted along the steep fault, rather than crumpled and folded like other mountains, that they essentially have no foothills. And to answer the question of why they're so pointy, well, we kind of already did. It's a combination of this formation mechanism, the steepness of the Teton Fault, the composition of the rocks, that they're made mostly of granite and gneiss rather than softer sedimentary layers, and their relatively young age that makes them so pointy. Glaciers also played a role by carving sharp peaks, horns, and U-shaped valleys during glacial maxima of the Ice Age from around 2.5 million to 10,000 years ago. And the last and potentially most significant reason that they're so pointy is because their uplift continues today. New rock is still being exposed faster than it can erode because the Teton Fault is still active. And it's not just the uplift that continues. The movement along the fault continues in both directions. The Jackson Hole Valley continues to sink and the mountains continue to rise at an estimated one to two millimeters per year. Although that may sound like a very slow growth rate, it's not insignificant. Very large earthquakes up to magnitude seven are possible here. While the last major one occurred thousands of years ago, GPS and LIDAR studies show ongoing motion. Some studies even involve digging trenches to observe the fault's motion and deformation over time. I actually helped dig one of these trenches back when I was, oh, 21 or so as a summer intern with the USGS. These trenches can reveal evidence of past earthquakes that aren't visible at the surface. We can even date past earthquakes by collecting samples along the fault surface within the trench. And this can help us determine earthquake recurrence intervals. Studies of the Teton Fault indicate that surface rupturing earthquakes have occurred every about 1600 years on average. But the last big quake was over four or 5,000 years ago, which could mean that the fault is overdue for another major event. But earthquakes are not cyclic or predictable, so even though we can estimate recurrence intervals, we can never predict when an earthquake will occur along a fault. So this fault being overdue for an earthquake could also mean nothing. But the other thing we can get from these trenching studies is an idea of the magnitude of past rupture events along the fault. And understanding the potential magnitude of a future rupture event along this fault is incredibly important for informing risk assessment and emergency preparedness. So next time you look up at these jagged peaks, remember, much of these rocks are over 2.5 billion years old, and the range is still rising today. And don't forget to check out my Yellowstone videos to hear more about the geology of this region, especially with regard to the volcanic and hydrothermal activity. See you guys there. Bye. Look at that one. That is a perfect example. We've got the band in nice, and then the straight cut across of that granite intrusion. Oh my gosh. And both of these are still over 2 billion years old. Isn't that insane? And look, it's everywhere. Look at this one. Nice. And then granite on top. This one cuts across the intrusion. Oh, another one here going across the layers. Come over here a little. Sorry, sorry, cameraman. <laughs> oh my god, you got granite. You got nice. You got granite. You got nice. Oh, oh here's another good one. Nice. Here, let's get a close up of this one. 
Okay, so you see the coarser grain granite and then the banded gneiss. This is what the granite looks like when it's been heavily metamorphosed, altered under high heat and pressure. That's because it has been through so much tectonics being so old. See the gneiss? This is the original 2.7 year, billion year old gneiss. And then you've got granite intrusion, granite intrusion. Look at this beautifully banded gneiss, this 2.7 billion year old gneiss. Then come over here. Look, we have the same gneiss, but then you've got intrusion over here, intrusion over here of this younger granite, these magmatic intrusions. And this granite, if it gets metamorphosed again, will end up like the gneiss, but right now you can just see the clear difference and it's just so beautiful. Look at this beautiful banding of this nice, this 2.7 billion year old nice. Incredible. Okay, so this view, if you're curious, is at Phelps Lake. And this is, you can come out here on the Woodland Trail. This is like a mile out. It's really easy. And look at this piece of nice. Look at all these beautiful nices and granites. And look, once you look in the water, it's even more amazing. Oh my gosh. But keep in mind, you can't take anything. Trust me, it's killing me. <laughs> it is a national park, but just so beautiful to look at. That's one thing I've noticed about, you know, up here in Yellowstone and Tetons this week, it's been the water is so clear. That doesn't even look like there's water there but there is so and the nices and the granites they just look so beautiful in the water because they're not all you know moss covered and stuff sorry for the biologists out there that actually like that <laughs> i want my rocks clean to uncover the amazing story behind these geological story to uncover the geological story of these um Hold on. And fun fact, these mountains are actually named after breasts. Yep, the French guys that came and found these mountains thought, I guess those look like breasts. So there you go. There's a fun fact if you didn't know. <laughs> okay.